brand new class today, and we're going to be talking about forgiveness. And um, boy, this is a, this is a, a topic that is, uh, I think, extremely difficult for most Christians, and that is being able to forgive someone who has wronged you in some way. And uh, that creates a, a tremendous amount of problems for us in our own lives when, when I'm holding back and I say, I just, I just can't forgive this, this person because they've wronged me and I, I just can't get over it. Uh, what does that do for us? It, 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 it creates a, a tension within us and, it, and a, a resentment and it just builds and it makes things worse and worse. And then you don't even know what to do when you encounter that person again. You know, how do you, how do you, how do you treat them? And particularly if that person is a, is a brother or sister in Christ. And so in this class, we want to be talking about forgiveness and what we can do to, um, you know, some really practical things that we might do to be able to, uh, to grow in that area and to be able to truly forgive. You know, you hear things a lot of times... There's a lot of uh, little cute sayings out there, you know, you just need to forgive and forget. Well, it, it, it's not quite that simple. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can forgive somebody, but you don't necessarily forget it. it uh, you can't just blank it out of your mind forever. It's still there. Um, but if you choose to forgive, then that memory no longer has to be a, this dark, ugly thing that, that, you, that is holding you back. So we want to talk about this morning, this is just called, I've titled this, the, the Foundation of Forgiveness. Let me just begin here. Action-adventure films are the most popular genre produced in Hollywood. A common theme within these movies is revenge. And I, I've noticed this is just, this is a growing thing too within, within movie, the movie industry. There are a couple of older films. Complete the following quotes. And this is from, an old, from a movie called Dirty Harry. And Dirty Harry said, go ahead, blank, 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 make my day. Okay, and he's got his 44 Magnum and he's going to shoot this guy, you know. And so, but it, it's funny how that, that, that sticks in our minds. Everybody remembers Dirty Harry and uh, that's Clint Eastwood uh, and go ahead, make my day. Here's another one. Um, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father, blank, blank, blank. I have no clue. <laughs> Prepare to die. That's from, uh, what was the name of that? Um, Princess Bride? Yeah, Princess Bride. <laughs> That's a, an older movie. It's... Anyway, these are, these are movies that have had uh, impact um, in people's lives. That's why we can still quote, make my day. Uh, they're repeated over and over again, and so they become a part of... of of how we think, and it's an unfortunate that these types of things stick in our memory. Go ahead, make my day with the idea that you're going to shoot somebody. Uh, but that, that whole topic of vengeance is certainly there, isn't it? And vengeance is seen throughout our society. There is uh, road rage, there's drive-by shootings and gang killings, killing each other, yet vengeance leads to guilt, leads to anger, to depression. That is so very common today. One counselor said this, I quote, nearly all the personal problems that drive people to seek pastoral counsel are related in some way to the issue of forgiveness. You know, you think about it, I, I, I think about that, it's, it is true. It really is that these issues um, of, of feeling guilty, of feeling angry, of feeling depressed, and a lot of other emotional issues that people take on, this baggage at the root of all that, a lot of times is I haven't been able to forgive someone uh, over this particular instance. So let's begin with just a little bit of discussion here. Uh, first question is here, do you think that forgiveness, why do you think that forgiveness is such a difficult problem? I think we've made it clear that it is a problem, but why do you think that it's such a, such a difficult problem? It involves feeling. Okay, it involves feeling. It's it pretty strong feelings too, isn't it? Correct. Okay, so it involves feeling. So it's, it's at an, emo an emotional level. That makes it a very difficult problem to deal with. We're dealing with our own 
personal emotions. Okay. Any anything else that causes causes us to to make make this such a difficult problem? It's costly. It's costly. In in what way, Mark? Well, it it costs us in a way that you know all of a sudden we have to admit that we needed to forgive that person. It's not always easy. It's not free. Okay. Um, Okay, it, co- it does. I, I get what you're saying. It, it costs us something to forgive, mm-hmm. doesn't it? There, there's, an, there's an expenditure here, and so it, it's costly to do that. And so it, it makes this difficult, and uh, how we feel about forgiveness, um, you know, it just, sometimes you feel it's just, it's just not right. God has placed into us a, a sense of justice, and sometimes we think it, it's just not right. And so, it, all right, if I have to forgive, well, it, it, it violates a part of me. That's what it feels like. And so I don't, I don't like that. Well, here's a second question, number two. How can you be certain of God's forgiveness? How can you be certain of God's forgiveness? This is forgiveness of you. How can you be certain of that? Okay, Jason said he has sent his son to die for us. And so that was done, that sacrifice was a, a showing of, of a means by which we can be saved. It's, and he's willing to offer forgiveness, even though we are sinners. John? He tells us how we can be forgiven. And so um, I think it boils down to uh, trusting in what he's told us. Um, if his word is reliable, then we can be certain based on that. Good. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, In him, in, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Okay, so it makes it real clear there that he says, The forgiveness of our trespasses, our trespasses, our sins. Okay, so he's willing to forgive us of our sins. And that's a really important concept for us to keep in mind. He is willing to forgive us of our sins. No matter how many and to what level and degree that they are, God is willing to to forgive those sins. And number three here says, if you forgive 70 times 7. Now, you do the math, that's 490 times, right? And, and if, you're, if you're able to forgive 70 times 7, like Jesus taught Peter, do you ever question the offender's repentance? Yes. <laughs> All right. Mark says yes. And and you, it's also sort of funny when you think about Peter, because they were originally taught that you only had to forgive someone three times. When Jesus says 70 times 7, Peter goes, what? Now, that's a lot more than I was taught as a kid. Well, it, it, to say seven times was to go way out there. Right. And to say, yeah, uh, up to seven times, Jesus? And, you know, uh, and so when Jesus' answer it, it is not to say a literal 400. Nobody's going to count to 490. That wasn't the point. The point is it's way beyond anything we, could, we would even, any number. You don't put a number on it. And so this was to put it to such a far extreme that there is no limit. Okay? And, and so the hard thing here is, well, is this person really sorry? Because I, I don't think they are. You know, the first time when somebody does something and you say, I, I forgive you, is that... Is that Hard? No, we can, we can generally do that. How about the second time? It's the same person, same, same offense. And they, they do this the second time. You say, okay, I'll, I'll forgive you. Third time. Well, all right. Uh, I guess one more time. And the fourth time. You know, we just keep going down the line. And as it progresses, doesn't it get to be more difficult? Because now you really have, you have a reason to say, I are you really sorry for what you're doing? Now, I just want you to keep that thought in mind. We're not going to answer all these questions. We'll be getting into these things later. 
But it, it's, it's natural for us to look at that and say, um, I, don't, I don't think he really is or she really is sorry for all these things. All right. But let's keep in mind what Jesus said. And number four, if I always forgive those who wrong me, where is the justice in that? And again, we, we are a just people. God puts that into us, and, uh, and so we, we have this, this sense of justice, and justice is not being, we want to do something about this other person, please. Isn't that what we want? Don't we, you know, if you've got a conflict, what do you do? You, you run and say, I want you to take care of this person for me. <laughs> and uh, that, that happens all the time, doesn't it? And, uh, and so here in this, in this in, we're going to be talking about forgiveness. It's not take care of the other person. It's what do I need to do? And I need to learn how to really forgive. Okay. All right. Our attitude towards forgiveness depends on which, on which side we stand. And there are really two points here. When we're on the receiving end of mercy... And that would include all of us, by the way, as we look to God having forgiven us. But when we're on that receiving side of mercy, we naturally consider forgiveness as the highest of all virtues. And we should see it that way. Okay? That is what God has done for us. But the counter to that, the opposite side here, is when we are on the offended, when we are the offended party, forgiveness often seems a gross violation of justice. And there that, there's that kind of dichotomy between these two that are tugging at each other all the time. And I really want to point out something as, as, we, as we get to this point here, is that we are dealing really with the nature of God himself. Is God a God of mercy? Yes. Is God a God of justice? Yes. yes. All right. And so that, that is a part of us. That's a part of our DNA as well. God created us in his own image. We have those, those senses. Uh, and so we need to be a person of mercy. We need to be a person of justice. And we have those built within us. And so how we deal with that seeming, seemingly conflict within us is, is what forgiveness is all about, okay? Forgiveness can never be fully accomplished until we understand the foundation upon which all forgiveness is based. The idea of forgiveness follows the act of sin. So that's really where we're gonna begin our, our study this morning. We're gonna be looking up a lot of verses. So get your Bibles ready. And uh, we want to, um, the first point here is says, God does not forgive by simply looking the other way when we sin. Now, that's a, that's a, you know, a figure of speech. To look the other way is just, just, just to kind of ignore the problem, right? Just kind of turn and look the other way. We don't just look the other way. So what do we learn from the following verses about, about God and our sins? Okay, so we're going to read each of these passages and uh, want to have some discussion about... Um, what we learn about God and, and about our sins from these passages. Galatians chapter 6. Um, I'll go ahead and read these so that uh, everybody that's listening can hear it all right. Chapter 6 and verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. What do we learn here from this passage? Okay, what do these lessons, what do we learn about God and about our sins? What do we learn about God here? Our sins have to be paid for. But they won't be mocked. Okay, our sins have to be paid for. I couldn't hear you, Lord. He won't be mocked. He won't be mocked. Yeah, that's a, God is not mocked. <laughs> so is he aware of, of of the sins that we're committing? Yes. He knows, doesn't he? And so it isn't like you got to tell him. God knows. And we want to, particularly if we're the one, the offended party, don't we want to, God, did you see what he did? <laughs> and God's, yeah, I, I got it. I understand. I see everything. And so God does know, doesn't he? All right. And, 
And what else do we see here about, about sin? It has consequences. Yeah. And how do we see that, John, the consequences? We see it in, he, he says, whatever a man sows, this is what he'll reap. And so it uses, a, you know, an agricultural uh, comparison. And if you sow a, a bean seed, you're going to have a, it'll grow a bean plant. But if you, if you sow, uh, you know, weeds, that's what's going to grow. And so <clears throat> what, you, what you put into something is what will come out of something. And so there can be either good or bad come out of that, can't there? And so it is with sin. If we are sinning, um, then there's going to be bad that grows out of that sin. All right. And God is very much aware of, of, the, of this taking place. Now let's turn over to the little book of Nahum, the book of Nahum, in the, that'll be, it's about in the middle of all of the, the, the minor prophets there, right after, it's Micah, then Nahum. And we're in chapter 1 and verse 3, Nahum 1, 3. It says, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is His way. The clouds are the dust beneath His feet. What do we learn about God here? All right. And so that's, you know, there, there's a tremendous amount of power there, and that's sometimes if we are the offended party, aren't, we're saying you're a little too slow, God. We want, we want immediate results right now. Uh, would you please exercise it? But he is great in power. And so that we can just understand about God. Okay, God is a God of justice. He has great power. Thankfully, we should say, he is slow to anger. And so he doesn't just unleash this, um, you know, it's in a, in a vengeful way like we see uh, a dirty Harry doing, okay? This is, this is in, in a way, vengeance shall be mine, says the Lord. And so there will be a time of judgment. Uh, but that is God's time. And so it's good that there is this time of, of waiting and that God is very patient with us in all of this. Romans chapter 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. What do you see in this passage? God is rightfully angry against people who are unrighteous. Okay, God is rightfully angry about those who are living an ungodly life. Okay, so it does, is God, is He provoked by sinful behavior? Yes, He is. Okay, and as we're thinking about forgiveness, even, you know, among ourselves, uh, when someone sins against you, um, it, there's a, do you feel provoked? Yes. And, uh, and so we see that God also is provoked by the sins of people. Okay, the sins of people, the, the sins that, that they commit directly against God, the sins that they commit against one another. Okay, God is very much aware of this and... Uh, and so he's, his, it says that the wrath of God is, is revealed from heaven against all of this ungodliness and this, all this unrighteousness that's taking place among men. So God is very much aware of what's going on, and he does not like to see this. All right, Romans 6.23. And this one, uh, of course, most of you could go ahead and just quote for the wages of sin is death. And I just stop right there. All right. The wages of sin is death. So what do we learn about it? You sin, you die. Okay. <laughs> Plain and simple. And uh, that's, that's what the Scripture teaches. All right. Now, can there be forgiveness of that? 
Yes, that's the good news. That's the good news. Uh, uh, that is the gospel message, that you can be forgiven of that. And that is so good to know because the wages of our sin should end in, in death. That would be justice. And for everybody, if you're more inclined towards the justice side, do you want to die for your sins? No, I don't. Um, but you don't realize what, what uh, sister so-and-so said. Yeah, well, it's not nearly as bad as the sin that you've committed against God. And so I can be very thankful that God has um, forgiven me of my sins when, in fact, the wages of that sin or the penalty of that sin is death. And uh, Jesus died in my place for that, thus fulfilling the, the need for, that, uh, for His justice. Over into the book of Psalms, chapter 7. And I'll read verses uh, 11 and 12. God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. If a man does not repent... He will sharpen his sword. God, God will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. And so there is, a, you know, pictured as a, as a warrior would be. And so God is, it starts off by saying he is a righteous judge, isn't he? And so he is the, the one who has, and then when you go into a, think of a, a courtroom situation, when you stand before a judge, they're the, they're the ultimate authority, aren't they? Okay, now the lawyers can present their cases and there can be testimony of witnesses and so forth, but ultimately the judge, um, he's going to say guilty or not guilty, and he can sentence you. And so that's the, that's the job of the judge. And so God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. So, so God has to deal with this. We think, uh, boy, I'm really, I'm really upset because so-and-so did this thing against me. <laughs> Look what it says about God. Every single day, He's dealing with people. And it's not just you and I and a few you know, that we are, have in our relationships together. But this is with the entire world. And he, he is dealing with this on a constant and a daily basis. And so, well, again, we look back and we say, I am so glad that God is patient. Because, boy, if I was in that position, yeah, the world would have ended a long time ago. <laughs> and so God's patience is a, is a really good thing. But it goes on to say that he is as a warrior would be and there is going to come payment day. And so he is a God of justice as well. All right, Psalm 5, verse 5. So turn back a page. Psalm 5, verse 5 says, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. Okay, just, just a very clear uh, view of, of how God sees sinful people. The boastful shall not stand. They have no place to stand. They're, they are condemned by their actions and uh, they're not going to be able to stand before. You hate all who do iniquity. Iniquity is just a, a word for sin. Uh, he hates everyone who has committed sin. And so unless there is a forgiveness of that sin... Uh, God is, there is going to be, His wrath will be felt by those that commit sin. All right, in Proverbs chapter 17. seventeen fifteen. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. He who justifies the wicked. Does that ever take place? In our world, all the time. Yeah, give, is, anything that comes to your mind? Any, any, an example? Uh, 
or even in a, in a general sense. Okay. All right. People being right. Treating people just the same as they feel like they're being treated. They're not, even if that person isn't. Okay. Um, Having uh, any kind of conflicts based on race or, you know, just the way a person looks. Yeah. That's wrong. Okay. He who justifies the wicked. Yeah, our nation has said it's okay to murder babies. And uh, the re really sad thing about that is we had, a, we had judges that said, yes, it's okay. And uh, so that has taken place. And it says that here in this verse that he who justifies the wicked, he who condemns the righteous. You know, God is very much uh, opposed to that type of thing. John? Well, I just think of uh, <clears throat> situations where... Um, you know, somebody uh, does something and they get off on a technicality. Yeah. They're made, they're justified in the sense of, well, um, there's this little thing that happened over here. We didn't quite fulfill some minor, minor point. So a person can literally get away with murder when yes. it's apparent uh, to all that they indeed did, did do that, but um, we're going to let them off. Well, right. that's, that's making them justified. All right. You know, what, what came to my mind on this whole idea of being, of justifying the wicked is just, is the, the corrupt, corrupt ways in which, um, you know, somebody, you pay off somebody. You pay off that, that, uh, that, uh, that judge or, the, you know, some person, and they will lie or they will twist things around or they'll find that loophole that John is talking about in some way to get a person off who is obviously guilty. Carrie? Um, to make it personal, sometimes we justify our own sin. We say, you made me mad. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You made me mad. Can anybody really make you mad? That's kind of a you, cho you have to choose. Uh, yes, you can be prov provoked. Uh, there are things, uh, yeah, we won't go into that too deep. That just gets, gets uh, but yeah, it, we are responsible. Yeah, we, we use it to justify our actions, you know, like if we hit somebody or if we, you know, parents who abuse their children, well, they, they made me so angry that I, that's what I did. Okay. Our own actions, because our own sinful actions. actions, then we justify because somebody uh, provoked us in some way. Okay, good. All right, and Ephesians chapter two and verse three. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Okay, what do we learn about ourselves here? Well, what does it say? It says we were, yeah, we were, we were all, in, we were living by the lusts of our flesh. We were indulging every desires that we wanted to. We were children of wrath. What does that mean, children of wrath? Wrath. We were sinning in our on our way to to death. Yes, yes. Okay, the wrath would be, we'd be referring to the wrath of God, doesn't it? Okay, to the judgment. So we were children of of uh, meaning that we were headed for that direction, weren't we? All right, and so of course as we're familiar with the Ephesians here, and so we know that 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 we were able to turn it, Jesus turned that around and, and provided us a way to get out of that. But what, what do we learn from all, this? Was a lot of verses we looked at, and there'd be many more we could we could see. There's uh, there's a few things we should we should understand. One is that God is 
He is completely aware of every sin and every, every act that people commit within this, on, this, on this planet. All right? There's nothing that he does not know. He's all-knowing of these things. And so we don't need to necessarily point out anything to him. He's, he's aware of it. And uh, that isn't to say you can't, you know, in your own prayer to God, be saying, you know, I'm really upset with brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Help me, Lord, with this situation. You know what, the, what it is, so help me. And so we know God is aware of everything, isn't he? Okay, what else do we learn from, from all of these passages? What, what takeaways do we have? God is aware of all sin that's taking place. Rick? God will, he's aware and he will justify and he will, he will bring justice. Okay. God is a God of justice and there will be a day of reckoning. And so all of those sins are going to be paid for, every single one. Now, there's two ways in which they can be paid, right? One of them it is you have to face God, and no man is going to be able to stand before Him in that, in that time, and you are going to experience the wrath of God like, you know, this is, this is not, a, not a, a good thing. And what is the second way? We can have all of that sin forgiven through Christ. And so what we're seeing is the opposite side, and that is God's forgiveness and His mercy that is applied. And so that's what we learn about both God. He is a, he is a just God. He knows all these things, and there will be justice. So if we can just get that in our minds, yes, justice will prevail in the end. And so just give me, Lord, the patience like you have uh, and, and just to show mercy until the end, knowing that he is the perfect judge. John? I think we learn also that <clears throat> we're all in the same boat. We have, we have all uh, been on the wrong side of, of sin. And so um, uh, when it comes to thinking about others' <clears throat> offenses against us, um, we should be a little bit more understanding, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because we're we're just as much in need of that forgiveness as as the other person is. Okay. Maybe not in this situation, but uh, doesn't we don't have to go very far to realize, yeah, I've I, I've been in need of God's forgiveness also. Okay, so it brings it brings to our minds our own need um, to to have to be forgiven, and so um, now if you've lived an absolutely perfect life. Then you can you can have uh, the, more of the the justice thoughts, um, but seeing as though none of us have, uh, we need to uh, understand that although I, I may be pretty good in this area, but oh boy, I do really bad over here, and I'm and I'm counting on God's mercy and the blood of Christ to cover all of that, and if He can do that for me, then can't I overlook this one? transgression of someone else against me. Yeah, it makes it look, by comparison, makes it look pretty small. And so it really is, a, it's a helpful thing to look at it in, in, those, in those terms. Okay. All right. Number two. God's forgiveness is seen in the justification of sinners. Read these verses and explain how a sinner can receive God's forgiveness. All right, we turn over back to the book of Romans, and we're in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. He says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into His grace in which we stand, and we exalt in the hope, in hope of the glory of God. So, Again, um, how can a sinner receive God's forgiveness? Through Jesus Christ. Okay. Through Jesus Christ, having been justified by faith. 
and faith is, is, is Jesus, all right? By faith in Christ, we have peace with God. And so the peace is brought about by Christ. Also in chapter 5, I'll pick up reading in verse 6, 6 through 10. For while we were still sinners, or while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for the righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone may even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And so a well-known passage, but I really like the part where he's talking here And he says that we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him, through Jesus. And we have been, we were enemies, and it is is while we were enemies of God that we were reconciled to him. And so what what do we see within that reconciliation was the forgiveness. The only way you can be reconciled to God is to have him forgive you of the sins that you have committed. And so it is that we are reconciled back to God. And again in Romans, the chapter 6, a little bit longer passage right here, 1 through 7, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in a newness of life. For we have become, for if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. So he who died, who he who has died, is freed from sin. And so we see this beautiful uh, comparison here. Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. And he says, in the same way you die in your baptism, you're buried and you're raised to walk in a newness of life. You become a brand new person. And so we've done away with that old way of life. And in that in that forgiveness, where does that forgiveness happen? It happens actually right there in the act. When you have been buried with Christ, when you have obeyed the gospel, God says, that's it. Sins are gone. I forgive you. And so you're now, that wall, that barrier, that sin produced is removed. And you're now one with God. That restoration has taken place. So it's a beautiful analogy that we see. And we'll look at one more, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'll read verses 18 to 20. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself not counting their trespasses against, him, against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, this is an appeal to the people to be made right. Okay, he's speaking to an unbeliever. Be made right with God. And you can receive that forgiveness And so as the term used here, as ambassadors for Christ, we, that is our, that is our ministry, isn't it? We, we, you could say in a sense that that's a, that's a ministry of, of, of bringing forgiveness. Forgiveness is so vital for us. And uh, we want to bring, we want to offer the forgiveness that Christ gives us to be reconciled to God. We want to bring that to the world. Well, we need to apply that also in our own lives. 
and be willing to forgive one another in that same sense. When we see the magnitude of what God has done for us and continues to do for us uh, on an ongoing basis, it makes it so much easier than as I see an infraction from my brother or my sister to overlook that and move on. And not just push it aside, but to truly say, I forgive you. Okay. And we're going to talk more about the actual means by which we go about doing that uh, later. Now let's answer a few questions here. Question number one, forgiveness would never have been necessary if man had never sinned. sinned. Okay, that was the easy one. That gets us started. Everybody got that one right. Number two, who did man first sin against? Okay, what was that? Charlie, you were the first one to say God. <laughs> By disobeying him. Yeah, he said. Okay, where were they? They're in the Garden, Garden of Eden. Eden. In the Garden of Eden. So yeah. who, who was it that, that sinned? Adam and Eve. Eve Adam. first, and then she's like, try it. And he was, I did it first. <laughs> okay, yeah. so we see, we see that a man has sinned against God. And that was the very, this is the very first sin. This is clear back to the Garden of Eden. Uh, you can eat from any tree of the garden, but from this, this tree do not eat. And if you do, you shall die. He knew the, he knew the law, and yet he still violated the law. They, they violated the law. And so man was the first one to sin, and, they, and man sinned against God directly. Okay, that's, that was the origin of, of, of sin. And so it started right there in the Garden of Eden. Number three, therefore, who was the first to forgive? God, the, the, the one who had been offended. Okay, it had been God was the one who was offended. Man is the one who violated God, and God had to then reach out and say, I will forgive you. And this, of course, starts the entire plan of God into place. He had a plan for how He was going to bring that about, and it came through Jesus Christ. And so that, that Christ could die and then provide that forgiveness to all that would obey the gospel. Okay? So this was something that uh, God was the first one to, to be offended, and He's the first one then, then to forgive. Okay, so He is the originator of forgiveness. It starts with God. If you get nothing else out of this lesson, remember that, all right, that God is the one who originated forgiveness. He had been deeply offended, and now He is, he is willing to forgive. Number four, who needs that forgiveness? Everyone. Okay, everyone. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All right, so all means all. It means everyone. It's, it's uh, all people. There is no one who has not sinned. Jesus is the only person that ever did not sin. All right. And number five, discuss how God's forgiveness will help me to forgive other people. All right, now we bring it out to ourselves. We've seen kind of the, the backdrop of all of this. This is how God is. This is God's nature. This is who He is. This is what happened. This is how man sinned against God. Now discuss how God's forgiveness will help me to forgive other people. Sure. So, say for instance, somebody did like a really horrible thing, um, and they think that how could God forgive me, and God forgives me for that, then... You know, they like, they broke my, you know, or hurt, hurt me deeply by, by some words, you know what I'm saying? But yet here I've done something really bad over here. God forgive me for this one, but why can't I forgive him for that? Um, plus, he also said that if you can't forgive, then I can't forgive you either. Mm, we'll be talking about that passage later too, Charlene. All right, good. Anybody else? How does God's forgiveness, how will it help me to forgive other people? John. He doesn't ask us to do something that he is unwilling to do himself. Uh, yes. So, um, he's been there and he knows what it's like to be offended and he has more right to be offended than we do. 
You know, sometimes we, we, we look at something and we say, you don't know what it's like. God said, yes, I do. As a matter of fact, I know a whole lot better than you do <laughs> because I've been offended by every human being on earth multiple times. And it kind of just sh shuts you up, doesn't it? There's not much you can say after that, saying, I don't understand. Yes, God does understand. Rick? Well, I think it also, you know, his example um, and what we were reading earlier shows us that we are to forgive and that if we can turn it over to God and let him deal with it, he will make it just in whatever way, however it comes out. It's horrible things happen in this world. And uh, we don't have to seek that vengeance ourselves. We need to seek peace with God. And part of that is through our forgiveness of others and let him be the judge of that. Because we may not know what happens to that yeah. individual. Right. Um, they may turn their life over to God. Mm -hmm. Let God be God. Let God be the judge. Yeah. joy that would come even though they may have done a terrible thing uh, you, I had an uncle that was murdered mm -hmm. and I don't know that man that murdered him may have turned his life over to God I mean so it's not my place to judge that man uh, over that time. you know and, and in, in, in classes as we as we move through this we're gonna we'll deal with some there'll be situations that are uh, such something like that Rick where it's uh, a loved one is murdered or, you know, some terrible thing that's happening. You say, how in the world can I ever forgive that? This is why it's so important that we build a, found, a biblical foundation upon which everything else rests. Okay? If your foundation is not set in stone, it's going to sink on you when something difficult comes up. And so the foundation is found in God, in God Himself, in that God was the one who was offended God is the one who chose to forgive. And God is the one that has experienced offenses like nothing that you and I will ever experience. And so if God can do that, then we who are made in His image should be doing the same thing, shouldn't we? All right? And so we, we, we got to just... It won't necessarily change your emotions in the moment, but it certainly will give us a reason to, as we think on these things, to ponder it and, and say, you know, I, yeah, the, the emotion swept over me for the moment and I shouldn't have done this or, or maybe I should have, you know, been quicker to respond and, and be more forgiving right off. But um, when I think on God and what He has gone through and how He responded, I, I, can, I can act in the same way. I need to be a child of God. And a child of God responds like God would respond. And we already know how God responded, don't we? Okay, He chose to forgive. And so that's going to be kind of where we're, where we're headed. Carrie? Um, God's example of <coughs> choosing to forgive people for sins that we would have a hard time forgiving people for. Mm -hmm. he, forgives, he forgives heinous yes. sins. Okay, God forgives. She said that it's, we have a hard time with certain, you know, even classifications of sins. There's some things that we say uh, that just, you know, it, it just it violates everything I believe in. And it's just, it's, it's horrible. God is, he's already experienced that. And he was able to forgive every situation. I, I, I guess we could learn to be a forgiving people because we have such a great and forgiving God. That's, that is the only basis, and that is the foundation on which we're going to build um, our, our thinking about how to be a forgiving people, okay? All right, thank you for all your comments, and we are we're finishing right on to fact I got 30 seconds left here, <laughs> and uh, this is amazing. We're actually finished on time. Let's, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, as we have uh, looked back uh, to your word and considered this whole thought of forgiveness, um, we see that you are the perfect example. And so, Father, uh, as you have been so willing to forgive the multitude and, the, and the, the level of sins that have been committed against you and you have seen men uh, against one another 
yet you have chosen to forgive, and it was at the cost of, of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we learn from that that we, too, need to be a forgiving people. And so help us, Lord, to just at this point, just to really focus on you and what you have done and what you have created for us as an example of that. And uh, God, help us to be able to rethink and uh, to turn our lives and, and depend upon you and trust in you um, in all things. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.